Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Seditionists. We finally decided on a name, and we like it, and we're going with it. Uh, and I think the definition uh, bodes well for, for Keith and I. And uh, we certainly are looking forward to, to many years together doing this wonderful video, video talk. Um, one thing that's important to remember, though, is that we'd like to hear your opinion on things. We'd like you to uh, join in the, in the conversation and discussion. We'll be absolutely more than happy to uh, respond to comments either on YouTube or via our Twitter or wherever, wherever you would like. Uh, that's sort of part of the enjoyment and, uh, and a learning experience for us as well. Uh, today we're talking about uh, a topic that gets everybody sort of all wound up, and that's homework. Uh, is there a point to homework? What's the point of homework? Uh, is homework something that's needed now in the future, whatever the case may be? So uh, we're going to start talking about that a little bit, and maybe for once out of several out of several um, episodes, maybe Keith and I are going to possibly disagree on this, agree on this one. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Keith, go ahead, buddy. Well, I mean, for me, the bottom line is that homework is a form of practice, right? If the objective is skill mastery for students, then some students will need more practice than others. Some students will need to practice in one way and not in another way. Regardless of whether we're using a traditional sequence like the Madeline Hunter model of instruction or we're using a slightly shifted sequence of instruction like we do in, say, the quote-unquote flipped classroom, for me, ultimately, the idea of homework is practice. Are you giving the students an opportunity to go through their conceptual understanding, utilizing the material that you have, and try to reinforce those skills using the things they have at hand? Um, for students who have a very high natural aptitude in a thing, they may not need to do the homework for skill mastery. They may not need to practice that skill. They may already have attained the achievement of the mastery uh, at the mastery level the teacher has asked of them. Other students may need vastly more than the assignments that the teachers give. So I'm very concerned when we talk about homework, about the way in which traditional homework has been prescribed, everyone do X, that's very troubling to me because it doesn't seem individualized. And that's certainly a revolutionary idea is the individualization of instruction. Um, but to me, homework is inoffensive so long as it's useful to the learner. The thing that I get bent about really is again, prescribing that everybody has to do the same thing the same way. And most importantly, utilizing that in any way as a form of assessment. I could give a crap if a person you know, falls all over themselves in the homework, so long as eventually at the end of that process, they have the skill mastery and they come in and they can demonstrate that. So I think assessment really becomes a huge uh, parallel part of this conversation. What do you think, Rob? Well, unfortunately, Keith, once again, for our viewers, there's an agreement here. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we might have one. <laughs> I know, really. Here's my thing about homework. And, and again, it goes very much hand in hand with the whole concept of individualization. I, I, I'm actually, I would say that I'm a proponent of homework. I believe in homework. Mm -hmm. uh, if done correctly, if used correctly, and that's the caveat here. Um, you're a musician and so am I, and I think that's why we get along so well. Uh, the idea of going to my lesson, being taught something, I had to practice it to improve it. Now, once I got to that mastery, I didn't have to practice it as long or as often or anything like that, but I certainly have to spiral back and hit some of those basics every once in a while as well. So the idea of homework as practice is crucial. And there's only two ways you can really raise achievement when you get down to the bottom nitty gritty of it, and that's better instruction and more instruction. So I like the idea of getting some practice time at home. The problem becomes that it becomes busy work, which I am vehemently against. Amen. Where if a if we if we if a kid can practice it with ten problems, don't give them twenty. It's just silliness. It's not it's not worth any of our time. And right now, time is of the essence with everything in education. So so that's my big thing. If they, if you, if you can get what you need out of it out of, out of it as a teacher, and the students can practice it enough with ten, don't give them twenty. The other part is. You know, if it's an extension activity of what you've already done in the class, that's great. Don't give them hours of it. That's ridiculous. And then, of course, you know, preparation. If you want to do something in preparation of your lesson, if you want them to do something like that at home, that's okay, too. But, again, make sure it's authentic, make sure it's realistic, and make sure it's something you're actually going to use. 
that's sort of the, that's sort of the mindset that I, I, I love to think about is just be practical. You don't want to go home and do hours of work when you can get the same amount done in 10 minutes. Keith, back to you. Absolutely. And so I guess this leads to the next, because I think we're in a fundamental agreement on that. The implementation of these ideas to say we're, we are going to shift away from a massive amount, a punitive amount, and a production-minded set of homework practices. Why do you think it is, and you may have some insight into this as a supervising administrator in a way that I don't, teachers just seem freaking terrified of giving up. Well, what are my grades going to be? What about accountability? I need to teach my kids to be responsible. I, I find the idea that homework is the ideal vehicle for teaching responsibility really crazy. Um, why do you think that it is that teachers are, are so terrified of giving up homework as a weighted or, or, or in any way counted part of the assessment process? Yeah, and interestingly enough, uh, several years back, we went through that here at our district, and we set a 10% maximum, that the grade could only be 10% of the homework. And I think a lot of that was because we didn't really want it to be much at all, but the teachers, again, had that nervous feeling of letting that go. Um, and honestly, I, I sort of think it's probably rooted in um, perception, where, where, where a teacher feels like if I'm not sending something home to the teacher, to the parents, the parents don't know I'm doing something with them, they don't see what I'm doing, and I've got to bring it back, and it's got to be graded because everything has to be graded. Now, with that being said, I, I, I don't want the homework graded, but I do want the homework to be looked at so that it's meaningful. If it's practice, wouldn't it be nice for the teachers to have a moment to go, okay, well, I could see you're doing this okay. Let's look at this some more. You know, there's, there is that, and I don't want to call it a, a, an assessment, but I guess maybe formative. I don't, I don't know what you want to yeah. call it, but I want it to be meaningful. That, that's my biggest thing. And I think that's the parent's biggest thing. And as an administrator, I can justify that. When parents come to me and say, oh, this homework, that homework, I'm the wall, it's got to be practiced and has to be meaningful. Um, so I, I think that may be where it's coming from. That makes a lot of sense. And I think that. Um, reinforcing those ideas, saying, I, I, and we're not saying never look at it. Of course, we want the professional educator who has the content skill mastery and the pedagogical mastery to look at that material so they can have a better understanding of where the kid is. And I like, I like the phrase you used for that. I think it is good formative assessment. I want to know as you're doing it, how you're doing, but it shouldn't. And I'm, I'm a big fan of Rick Wormley's work. I was never a Rick Wormley guy. The first time I heard him talk, I was like, dude, this cat's out to lunch. But the more <laughs> I do those practices and the more I integrated them into my own. I'm like, this. he got it figured out, man. Because I look at the way that I ran my band room. I want to know what you're doing with practice. I was for, I really got into audio recording my kids at one time and sent home little devices and listen to what they're doing. I teach that at different conferences I go to, portfolio-based practice. You know, I want to know what you're doing. I want to hear that. Well, where does this fit into my grade? It's not graded. I don't give a crap about that. That doesn't matter. I think one of the reasons that you and I uh, often are on the same page as you say, musicians, I think that music education, because it is naturally performance-based and nat naturally skill mastery oriented, we're doing a lot of things that a lot of the other content areas are like, oh, we should do that. I don't care about what, how they practice at home. I care that they do practice. I want to know what's going on there, but I say not care. Grade-wise, it doesn't matter. The performance and the skill mastery and the final assessment is what really really counts. So formative assessment to me, looking at it from the band director's perspective, should count, quote unquote, for nothing, but it doesn't mean that it isn't important. And exactly as you just said, we can easily justify that to parents. Um, I do get a little concerned when we switch to a paper milieu for we non-musicians, for those non-musicians, that it really becomes about productivity. Um, hey, look at all the homework you're getting and somehow a bunch of homework or a bunch of papers or a bunch of graded artifacts somehow means something. That frustrates me. I don't like that idea. I don't care if there's a lot of artifacts. I care if there's a lot of skill mastery. My little anecdote to illustrate that, I, uh, my first failed grade that I ever got as a student was in seventh grade mathematics. And I won't use the teacher's name, but Ms. Yu um, failed me in second grade mathematics, seventh grade mathematics. And it wasn't because I didn't have skill mastery. I could do the basic algebra with two terms solved for X. I could do that. I suck at math, but I could do that much. But I failed because I didn't do my homework. How on earth is it an accurate reflection of my abilities as a student to say I fail at that skill mastery when I had consistently gotten A's on the assessment? That, to me, is the perfect illustration of the difference between what practice should be and what skill mastery should be. 
Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Um, you know, as, as you were talking, you were talking about the artifacts and the need for artifacts. You know, one thing that, that, that I've noticed as I've looked through sort of historical versions of education in general is that we have a tendency to put a lot of things onto our teachers, onto our educators, but we never take anything away. Uh, you know, we continue to add this initiative, add that initiative. We never take away some of the older initiatives. You know, it is possible that that maybe some of this desperation for artifacts may go back to the years of the necessary portfolio where, where parents came in and wanted to see their kids' portfolio and teachers had to give portfolios to the administrators. And I, mean, I don't know that to be a fact, but that might be another reason why they're so desperate to have those things to justify and prove. And let's face it, the community beats educators up a lot. So, I mean, sometimes, you know, maybe maybe that need to hold on to something that says, see, look, I did do this with your kid, makes them feel more comfortable. Again, not You're right, right, but an, an unfortunate sort of reality into where we've ended up. What do you think? I think you're absolutely right about that. And I write about this a little bit in my book, which should be coming out in the next two weeks. Um, the the n desire for the parent to see what they perceive as appropriate education is, is maybe important to the parent. I don't give a crap about that. I don't think that that should play any role at all in education policy or in pedagogy or in, in school craft, if you will. Uh, one of the anecdotes that I, that I write it, it, uh, having been schooled does not qualify you to school. I'm, I'm glad that you, madam or sir, learned X way doing Y thing and Z location. That has nothing to do with a contemporary analysis of appropriate pedagogy and the setting of policy and the practice of teaching practices that leads to your child's skill mastery. First of all, your child isn't you. And while they may be genetically based on that and maybe socialized in your family, it doesn't mean they learn the same way that you do. And it also doesn't mean even if you did get straight A's and you went to Brown, that I don't take that carte blanche as proof positive that your educational experience was outstanding. You know, I regard grades as, again, artifacts, cultural artifacts, really, that re more reflects your ability to navigate a system than it really does anything else. So perhaps one of these next conversations we have will really get into the weeds on what is assessment, what is it for, why do we grade the way that we do. I, I think that any serious educator would say that ABCDF does not tell us anything. If you were to ask about your child's skill mastery to me as your kids say English teacher and say, talk to me meaningfully about my child's skill mastery, the regurgitated response, 83. Did you, are you having a seizure? What, what was that? that says, you didn't tell me anything. Oversimplification of skill mastery to an integer is doing a disservice to the child. And having artifacts for the sake of having artifacts, I think is part and parcel of that and does the same thing. And that's hysterical because I totally agree. And I'm fighting a battle right now to go to a skills-based report card because Ooh. I always say a B doesn't tell me anything about how my kid's doing. You know, when you say, "What? how's my kid doing? B, okay. <laughs> now, I don't know what that means, you know. But, but if you tell me if he knows he's adding and subtracting, or they, you know, then then we're getting somewhere. Right. Yeah, so I totally agree with you, and I'd love to have that debate. We could definitely have that conversation here. Um, I'm going to wrap this up, and here's what I'm thinking we're saying here, Keith. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, musicians do it right. No, that's, <laughs> that's what it means. The, uh, here, here it is, folks. You learn it. You practice it an adequate amount to, to, to you as the individual to master it. And all of that boils down to the performance or the grade, the test, the, 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 the kumbaya at the end. All the stuff in the middle, the, the, the homework, the, the, the little activities are wonderful, but they're not the end result. They're not the goal. The goal point is to say, I have mastered X skill. And, 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 we're, and I think Keith and I are in agreement that we really, really don't care how you get to mastering that skill as long right. as you master that skill. Uh, if practice does it, great. If extension activities do it, fine. But, but, but the end result is the skill, not, not all the stuff in between to get you there. Those are, your, those are your lessons and your practice and your homework and things like that. Necessary, yes. Um, graded, probably not because we want to see the end result. Keith, I'll give you a chance to say goodbye here. 
Awesome. Completely agree. I think that's exactly where we need to be. And I hope that uh, as more teachers, you know, I would imagine this could be a challenging conversation for some teachers to say, but what about? By all means, that's why we're having this. So get down there into the comments on this video and engage with us so we can talk about that. If you have a countervailing point of view on this or anything else, share it with us at your convenience. Um, I'd be a liar if I said I couldn't plug right now. Go to katiereves.com. Make sure you sign up for the mailing list. The book's coming out. Insurrection, A Teacher Revolution in Defense of Children will be here soon. As always, my friend, Rob, good to see you. Good to see you too, Thank you. Thanks. And I'll be the first one to buy the book. I expect a signed copy. Goodbye. You got it. Thanks again.